Nair has just completed a PhD in trilingualism, triliteracy and identity. All good things come in threes. Uh, and she's written various articles on bilingualism and multilingualism. Her latest publication is the award-winning Teaching Children How to Learn, which she wrote with Gail Ellis, whom many of you will know. And I can't think of a better birthday gift for your favorite teaching colleague. So I hope you have a stimulating morning, and it only remains for me to hand you over to Dr. Nair Ibrahim. Okay. Thank you, Frank. And I'd like to thank uh, British, Council Peru, uh, British Council of Spain for inviting me, because I always like coming to Spain. So, hola. <laughs> um, so, my, yes, my session is going to be about three main areas. So, language, education, and the 21st century. And we're going to start by looking at the 21st century. I'm not going to look at 21st century skills, we know about those. But uh, what characterizes the 21st century? And I'm using statues. The statue, which is uh, called Voyageurs, Travelers, um, in Marseille. Um, and it's all about um, traveling. And it's about moving from one place to the other, which is very much a characteristic of the 21st century. Um, it's also about um, looking at the horizon, if you look at these statues, they actually have these holes and these gaps. But these gaps are the future that someone is going towards. And, but they're also taking their bits and pieces with them of their previous lives. And one of these elements that they take with them is language. And I would like to use another statue to talk about language and how language spreads around the world. And this is a, a statue called Partir, once again, the idea of traveling. Um, and it is in the Rose Garden in Florence. And it's basically the frame of a suitcase. And within that frame, you can see the lovely city of Florence. But if you look outside the frame, the city of Florence continues in a continuum outside the frame, just like language. Language doesn't remain in your lovely little um, country within its borders. Language travels. When people travel, language goes with people. So we are living in a world of super diversity, where um, cities and urban areas are becoming extremely super diverse in terms of people's backgrounds, people's cultures, and their languages. And also in a world of trans nationalism, not only at the level of politics and economics, but also at a personal and linguistic level. So, unfortunately, it hasn't always been the case. And even today, I think um, children in education are still suffering from what we call the monolingual bias. And the monolingual bias is when you look at individuals who are multilingual with the, mi the monolingual mindset. So what is that monolingual mindset? It is the greatest impediment to recognizing, valuing, and utilizing our language potential. Um, such a mindset is everything in terms of monolingualism being the norm even though there are more bi and multilinguals in the world today. This monolingual bias was a result of the focus on the importance of, the, of developing one language, the mother tongue, the national language, which of course is also important. However, it also meant that in the early um, 20th century, people used to think of language as something that was separate, as separate entities, and they existed in separate parts of your brain. Now, your brain can't contain so many languages, so only one could exist. So what was happening is we were kicking out all the other languages. The reality is that languages exist together. They coexist in the brain. And um, that's what is called the common underlying proficiency. You don't, for example, if you're asking a question, in any language is the same across cultures. The only thing that is different is the way you ask that question. So the idea of languages existing in your brain together and you using your knowledge of the different languages to actually communicate. However, what has education done? And in Cummins' words, we are faced with a bizarre scenario of schools successfully transforming fluent speakers of foreign languages into monolingual speakers. 
So what are we doing? We are beating those languages out of these children. However, I don't think the situation is as simple as monolingual versus multilingual. Here is a little picture of a five-year-old. This little five-year-old was in my research. And um, you have a Korean flag, so with a little girl under, neatly drawn under the Korean flag, speaking Korean. And then a white, a gap of white space. And a little boy speaking English under the Union Jack, another gap of white space, and the French flag and the, the young girl speaking French. Now, if you look at this picture, you can actually see the three languages are quite separate. The way the child has drawn these languages, they are quite separate, even though this is the same child. And I like to think of this line over there as the child's multilingualism. And within that multilingualism, she speaks three languages, she's five, the child is actually identifying the individual languages because this child needs to show the connection to these languages and the connection to these cultures. So you actually have to consider monolingualism as a healthy part of multilingualism when it's actually seen that way. Then we have the problem of the Anglo bubble. Now Hayek described the Anglo bubble as the idea that English is enough. If you speak English, you don't need to learn any other languages. If you speak English, you expect people to reply to you in English. However, that is not the case, because today English is part of an individual's multilingualism. English has to be part of that, of, of that language repertoire, because it is an important part of that language repertoire. English has actually um, contributed to making many people buy a multilingual in the world because English is just such a common language all over the world. However, let's not forget the other languages as well. I cannot um, talk about bilingualism, multilingualism, English teaching, monolingualism without mentioning the, the NEST debate the non-native English speaker teacher versus the native English speaker teacher. First of all, the non-native English speaker teacher is a non. I really do not like that term. Non-native English speaker teachers are not nons. They are actually bilingual teachers. And they have so much to offer the English profession. Because they've got another language, they've got other languages. They actually understand how children are functioning. They actually understand how children feel in the classroom when they have to learn different grammars, different sounds, different vocabularies. So we need to celebrate our bilingual teachers. And I'd like to draw your attention to TEFL Equity Advocates. I don't know if you know of that organization. It was set up in 2014 to support and to defend non-native speakers, native speakers or teachers like myself with strange sounding names. So um, do look them up because they do a great job. I think we have to come to the conclusion that monolingualism is passé. It is the literacy of the 21st century. It's the real linguistic deficiency. It's a figment of the imagination and a myth detached from reality, and it is a total waste of our biological linguistic potential. So what we need to do is celebrate the multilingual turn. And the multilingual turn is basically how, in the 21st century, we have opened up the doors to multilingualism, not only as separate languages, but as understanding how multilingual individuals actually function. And the multilingual turn recognizes the coexistence of multiple languages in societies, in individuals. It acknowledges multilinguals, multilingual repertoires. So instead of talking about, okay, I have a mother tongue, a foreign language, a second language, an additional language, that individual might have a multilingual repertoire. So 
What is my multilingual repertoire? I'll just tell you a little bit of a personal anecdote. I have English, obviously, as you can hear me, because you can hear me speak English, but I was not born an English speaker. My parents are Portuguese, so I actually speak Portuguese and have always spoken Portuguese with my parents. I was born in South Africa. Therefore, at the age of five or six, when I went to school, I couldn't speak English very well because I was speaking Portuguese at home, but they threw Afrikaans into the equation. English, Portuguese, Afrikaans, all at the same time. I was five. I found my grade one report the other day, and the first thing I went to say, okay, what did my teacher say about my language, about my English? And she said, Naia has a big language problem. <laughs> yes, I probably did. <laughs> After that, I learned French as my first foreign language at school at about the age of 11. So by the end of school, I could read, write and speak four languages. And that was normal. I didn't think about it as exceptional. My, um, nobody told me I was amazing. I was just South African. We all do that in South Africa. When I came to Europe, everybody thought, wow. When I got to university, obviously I'm a nut about languages, I studied German. And I studied um, Italian. And then I went to spend some time in a kibbutz in Israel, and I decided to study Hebrew. Oh, I forgot to tell you, I married to an Egyptian. I also studied Arabic. <laughs> My multilingual repertoire consists of about nine or ten languages. I don't speak them all to the same level. I don't use them all all the time because I don't need to. But that is my multilingual repertoire. So, um, the multilingual turn also recognizes language use as context dependent, as simultaneous, as complex, and as dynamic. Now, context-dependent. When I uh, was... W I spoke Afrikaans really well. Afrikaans is my second language. But today, when I try and speak Afrikaans, French comes out. Because I don't function in Afrikaans anymore. I function in French. So it's as if French has now become my second language. So can you see how context, how important it is in language learning? And multilingual competence is nonlinear. Uneven. It is dependent on the individual's histories and biographies. I just told you my language history, didn't I? So remember, the children you have in your class probably have some of these strange language histories, and we need to find out what they are, because they are actually quite interesting. So the, the child's linguistic environment is an environment that the child is usually born into. They don't have a choice. They basically lack agency in the, initial, in the initial enterprise of multilingualism or multiliteracy, because parents decide, teachers in the school system decide, or the policymakers decide which language you will learn. So what are these context-dependent factors? First of all, there's intermarriage. French mum marries Italian dad. Then there's migration for economic reasons, for personal reasons. I really, I, when I moved to Paris, I was really happy because I wanted to live in Paris. For political reasons, I think we all know the stories of um, refugees and migrants trying to come to Europe and having to pick up different languages. Then there's education, and education has had an incredible positive impact on developing individuals' multilingual repertoires through um, foreign language learning in the school, or community and heritage learning programs after school. That's how I learned to read and write Portuguese. My mother decided to put me in Portuguese school, after school. I hated it. Because my friends were doing ballet, they were going swimming, and I was going back to school. But today, I thank them, because I can function in Portugal as a Portuguese person. Um, and then, of course, you've got bi and multilingual communities. I know Spain has um, multiple multilingual communities, but of course Switzerland, my own South Africa, we have 11, far, 11 official languages in South Africa. 
Do you think I can speak those 11 languages? No, I speak two. And that's enough for me to function in my context in South Africa. Uh, oops. So when you talk to children, when you ask children to talk about their experience with language, with their different cultures, they mention three important things. The people that they interact with, that they speak with on a regular basis, the places where they use their different languages, and the experiences they have in these languages. Let's look at some examples. Here, is a little, here are the children. They are communicating with Dad. They're helping Dad make a salad. They are learning the words of the vegetables and how to make a salad in Italian, for example. Mum is telling the little girl a story, perhaps a story in French, because baby mum is French. So through interaction with the adults, the child is learning the language. That child's not learning any language. <laughs> Technology is brilliant. Technology is an excellent resource to expand, to allow, to expand language learning, to allow a child to learn autonomously. It doesn't, however, make you buy or multilingualism or multilingual, because language is actually a person-to-person -person thing. This is a picture of the, the, the five-year-old twins. They were twins. This is the other picture. And he has drawn place and experience. And what has he done? If you look at the three um, language contexts, France, this is obviously England, his rendition of the Union Jack and the Korean flag. What is he saying about France? Or, because when I, this is, when I, when I, um, I asked the children to draw their languages, this is what he did. So he says, it's about France. Yesterday, I visited a castle. And it's so, his experience of French is the trip to, it's a school trip to the Chateau de Vincennes, just outside of, France, of Paris. Then he talks about um, his English experience, but he says, it's about Lyon, English in Lyon, because he was in an English kindergarten just outside of Lyon, and his experience, or his, his, his memories of his English school was traveling to the school because it was quite far, they had to take the car. So he says, it's when I went to school with car. And his Korean experience, the parents used to go on holiday to Korea and they would spend about two months in, in, with, with family, but the mother would also put the children in a Korean school. And the children, uh, what, does it, what, what does he remember? He remembers a canteen in the Korean school. So the experience of language isn't all about grammar, vocabulary, and pronunciation. It's about living and experiencing the language. Another example of experience, and this one is brilliant. This is an English, French, Spanish speaker. I asked the children to bring objects that represented their languages. English, French, Spanish. I asked this child, OK, so what does this camel, which language does the camel and the um, Arab figurine represent? He says English. So I imagined camels walking along the moors of England. <laughs> and then I asked him why, and he said, because I went to school, to an English school in Dubai. His experience of English will forever be associated with the desert, with Dubai, so, and he's never lived in an English-speaking country, but English is important for him, and this for him is English. So has, can you see how language has become deterritorialized? It exists wherever individuals are or use the languages. So what happens when these individuals are communicating um, in these languages? Um, Grosjean, François Grosjean, he comes up with what he calls the complementarity principle, which basically means that um, bilinguals usually acquire and use their languages for different purposes, for different functions, in different domains. You can't always have, uh, have the same, uh, you, you don't always have the same experience in a particular language. So, for example, the ideal scenario would be excellent A and B, you can speak two languages perfectly. That doesn't exist, by the way. The reality is this. You live in France, you go to school in France, 
your French is going to be much stronger than your Spanish, which you only speak with mum at home. But imagine you moved to Spain. What would happen? The, other, the, other, the opposite would happen. Spain, Spanish would become strong, and um, French would probably lose some of its proficiency because you're not using it on a daily basis. So, and children are very much aware of this. Look at these two children from the British Council Bilingual section in Paris. This is what they said. Because when I was two, I lived in London, and I, went, and I spoke very good English. Uh, but when I came back to France, I lost all my English. So I came here, the British Council Bilingual section, to speak like I spoke in the past. And the 11-year-old, if you do not speak English daily in about three months, I will lose my English. They are very much aware of um, how easy it is to forget words, to forget your languages. But bilinguals don't forget. Bilinguals, it's not always a question of forgetting. It's a question of moving between languages. And it's a question of deciding whether you need to be in monolingual mode or in bi- or multilingual mode. At the moment, I'm in monolingual mode. I work for the British Council. I have been invited by British Council Spain. I am speaking English to you. You are all English teachers. But if I need to switch to French, to Portuguese, because the context allows it, I will. I'm going to give you an example of, um, sorry, a situation which is explained the context. Um, my, my father's 70th birthday, we were in France, we took him to a lovely restaurant, Portuguese restaurant. They do like their Portuguese food. And um, in, at that table, there were four languages. And there was always one person in that table, on that table, that did not speak one of the languages. So how did we solve that problem? Let's have a look. So my dad had his um, roast veal, and he's saying in Portuguese, a vitela assada está muito boa. It was actually very good, he said, his veal. Um, I turned to my husband and say, you know what, my dad really likes the vitella, and he has me code switching, vitella. Uh, what do you think? And he says, hmm, it's really good. He turns to my brother-in-law, who is Tunisian, and they say in Arabic, oh, el vitello helwa. The veal is really good. Aywa, he replies in Arabic. And then he, my brother-in-law, turns to my sister, they speak French to each other, and he says, Tu veux goûter le veau? C'est très bon ici. It's very good here. My sister turns to my mom, Posso provar le vitella? In Portuguese. Can I try the veal? And then I turn to my son, Karim, would you like to try some vitella? And uh, my, my, my son says, No, c'est bon. My steak frites fine. Switching <laughs> between English and French, as he did all the time. And of course, the waitress was sitting back in the background thinking, What's going on here? And she eventually asked us, in Portuguese, Vocês estão falar quantas línguas? How many languages are you speaking? We were speaking four and having a perfectly normal conversation. <laughs> so, language mixing is a choice. In that example, we, we were language mixing because we had to include um, everyone at that table. And children are very much aware of that. The little five-year-olds, this is what they say. She says something, talking about the mum. So the mum says something in English, and we have to say something. And we have to say something in English. Mum speaks English, and we reply in English. But, she said, there are some words that are difficult, so we just mix English and French. So the children are already aware that to communicate, but sometimes they use a mix of English and French. Get the little 13-year-old, I love this one because she says um, that mixing languages is fun. Um, it's like music. This child uses a metaphor comparing mixing music and mixing languages. And the last one, uh, when I mix languages, it's not like it doesn't come naturally. Um, when I do it, it's because I want to. It's not just like that. This young boy is very much aware that when he mixes languages, he mixes languages because he chooses to. It doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen because I don't know the language. However, one of the most difficult things about being a multilingual, and you could probably say this is one of the disadvantages, is the vocabulary. Sometimes the word just doesn't come. 
and it's called the tip of a tongue syndrome. You sit there, what's that word, what's that word, what's that word? And even your mother tongue, you sometimes forget the words in your mother tongue. And that's because of cross-linguistic transfer. Um, you sometimes hypothesize, hypothesizing about the language. You don't know the word, let's be honest, sometimes you don't know the word. Or you know too many words and you use the wrong one. And that affects communication and fluency. So you try and think of the word and it's not coming. And sometimes word or vocabulary retrieval is actually language specific or non-language specific. Let me give you an example. You've always heard how people feel how important it is that, that connection, that emotional connection with the language. And I'm going to give you an example from Ava Hoffman. She was Polish. She moved to um, America. And she wrote a book called um, Lost in Translation, A Life in a New Language, and how she had to learn English and how it felt to pick up um, that second language. And she, she used the word river, which for her, in Polish, was a vital sound, energized the essence of riverhood, um, of my rivers, of being immersed in rivers. River, in English, is a cold word, without an aura, it has no accumulated associations for me. It does not give off the radiating haze of connotation. For me, I had the same experience with liquid, but this time it's tea. My mother used to um, bring me this tea that in Portugal we call chá de cidreira. And it was always when I wasn't feeling well, my tummy was upset, and she'd come up with a tea, come on, drink your shat sidreira, you're going to feel so much better. And it had this lovely, lovely taste of my mum and the warmth of my mum looking after me. I, don't, I didn't know how to say that word for decades in English or French. I didn't want to learn how to say that word in English or French, because I knew the moment I did, I was going to lose that feeling, that aura. And um, I had to eventually, because my son got sick. So I thought, I need to go and buy my son some, my son, some shad cidreira. And I had to look up the word. It's melicity. It's a cold word. It has no feeling, no emotion. So today, I still talk to my son in English, and I tell him, would you like some shad cidreira? <laughs> um, multilingualism is all about, well, it's all about research and policy. We wouldn't be here today if research hadn't helped us understand how bilinguals and multilinguals function. And policy jumped on the bandwagon and th thought, OK, that is actually such, that's a good idea for both political and economic reasons. So let's look at research first. Um, I'm not going to give you loads of background, but just a couple of ideas of research um, into multilingualism that we know of. And I would think this one is one of the most papers ever written, uh, a Peel and Bit paper in 1962, the relation of bilingualism to intelligence. It basically, first of all, used um, um, the correct methodology, taking into account the fact that children in a new language context don't have the same proficiency in that language context as they would have in their mother tongue. And in the past, children were being tested in the new language when they couldn't, they could not show what they could do in that new language. And therefore, they were thought of as being not intelligent, you don't know how to speak the language, you're not good enough. But this, um, this paper changed all that, because it showed that sometimes, in certain contexts, bi bi bilingual children actually functioned better and were stronger at, at creativity, at being flexible, than monolingual children. And from there, we have like the floodgates of research were open, and just a couple of examples, um, second language acquisition, foreign language acquisition, bilingual context, CLIL, very big at the moment. Of course, for example, mother tongue-based multilingual, excuse me, education in um, contexts such as Africa and um, the Far East or Asia, where the children were um, bringing up, were brought up until about the age of five with two local languages, and suddenly they're thrown into school at the age of six in English or in French. They couldn't function. So um, the other, uh, you probably know about this, obviously this is Cummings. Another bit of research that is important for um, understanding multilingualism is the common underlying proficiency. 
So the fact that there are certain aspects of language and communication that are common across languages, what we need to do as teachers is teach the surface level differences. Okay? For example, if I say hello in English, I have to teach the ha. Yet, or la, I probably have to teach the a at the end of the day. So, the other thing that came out of Cummins' research is the Bix and the Kelp. Once again, you probably know about this. Basic interpersonal communicative <coughs> skills are those skills that individuals, and especially children, pick up really quickly because they want to belong. Um, when my son arrived in Paris, he was five, he couldn't speak French. When the, first day, the first couple of months in school were quite complicated for him, and I had the French teacher coming up to me, you have to speak French to help your child with French. I thought, no, that's not my... Sorry. By the time Christmas came, she was running off to me, Madame Ibrahim, Madame Ibrahim, your son speaks French. I said, yes, I know. It took me about three months to develop bics. But the kelp, the cognitive academic language proficiency, took much longer. They say it took about five to seven years to develop your academic language. So bilingualism, multilingualism, is a question of time. We love to use the um, analogy of the sponge. Children are like sponges. It, everything just goes in. It's not quite like that. It's actually hard work for children to be in a context where they don't understand what's going on, they don't understand what people want them to do, they don't understand the language. It's hard work. And it's also not a 10-meter race. Okay? So Usain Bolt could not teach you to become multilingual. It's long distance running. It takes time. So give children the time to take it in, to learn, and then to actually start using the language. They need time, they need patience, and they need support. Um, just very quick, we're going to look at how children become bilingual. It's either through natural language acquisition or school language acquisition. So natural language acquisition, you've heard perhaps of Simultaneous bilingualism, where children um, are functioning in two or three languages, if necessary, from birth till about the age of three. And this is what one of the children in the bilingual section in Paris, this is how they explained it. I speak two different languages, English and French. Um, I started to pronounce these two languages when I came out of my mum's tummy. <laughs> and then there's sequential or consecutivalism usually after the age of three, still in a natural context, and a little boy described it as, I lived three years in New York when I was four, and I went to American school. So he naturally picked up English. Very often this is actually described as children's, um, as bilingualism or even trilingualism is a child's mother tongue. So, for example, I wonder how many of you are able to actually say what your mother tongue is. I always struggle with that one, because technically I should say Portuguese, because that's what I spoke initially, but then English is such a strong language in my language repertoire that sometimes it's difficult for children to actually identify a mother tongue, because sometimes children have bilingualism or trilingualism as their mother tongue. In a school context, when once, it, once the children have a language or languages, as part of their language repertoire, any other language that they learn, they will use their knowledge of language to learn that new language. And that is um, how, that's basically the independence hypothesis. Um, let me just give you an example. A little boy, um, English and Russian speaking, came to France at the age of three. Um, first day in kindergarten, mum leaves him, oh, he doesn't speak French. At the end of the day, mum goes to pick him up. Um, he comes out without his bag. And the mum says, where's your bag? And the little boy says, oh, I forgot it. I, I'm going to go and ask my teacher where my bag is. And the mum, how can you ask a teacher? You don't speak French. Anyway, just left it. He comes out with his bag. So the mum asks him, how did you ask your teacher about where your bag was? And he said, where's Mosak? 
First day, he already understands he can use two languages to communicate. And a perfectly um, correct question, isn't it? Um, sometimes children need the non-verbal period, the silent period, where children are observing, they're analyzing the situation, they're taking it all in, and then eventually still children feel confident enough to start using oops, um, telegraphic or formulaic expressions. So, no go, you color, I want to play. Slowly but surely they start developing. This, co this context where children are functioning in multiple languages all the time, um, enhances their metalinguistic skills. And I'd like to show you, um, not only in terms of comparing grammars and, and vocabulary, but also in talking about language origins. And this is a nine-year-old, also in my research, who was trying to explain to me um, the difference between, or, or explaining what Farsi, or how Farsi, uh, the how, how the Farsi language functioned. She called it Persian. She said, we say that Persian is European and Indian language. So this nine-year-old is telling me that Farsi is an Indo-European language. And then she looks for examples of how similar Farsi is to European languages. She says, uh, daughter and dochtar are the same words, mother and madar, brother and baradar. You see how she's comparing the languages. And then she goes on to compare the writing. She says... Um, we don't put vowels in the writing because Farsi is written with the Arabic script. Um, so we need to guess the vowels. Um, but in English and French, we write all the vowels. So I think it's easier to speak English and French. And then these children, with so much experience in developing their languages, in comparing languages, in developing different vocabularies, they have absolutely no problem in learning even more languages. And the same girl who was explaining the whole origins of um, Farsi said, um, later I will speak French, Persian, English, Chinese, Spanish, and Japanese. No problem. Um, writing and literacy is another important aspect of research. I just wanted to show you an example of little, my little five-year-old twins in my research. When you, know, when you do research, you have to ask for consent. So I asked the children for consent as well. And they gave me their consent form signed in English, French, and Korean. Alice, uh, that's the um, Korean name, Voyer, French surname. And they signed it in the Korean Hangul script. I was so impressed. But even when children learn to write, they also mix their languages. Let's look at some examples. Cakes. <laughs> Why not? I speak French at school with a tutor. This child is American. She didn't hear tutor, she heard tutor. The reason why I'm trilingual, she heard the ingle um, uh, spelling convention. I learned it French. Even monolinguals do that. My mother subscribed me to the British Council. <laughs> Using the wrong word, you don't subscribe someone. <laughs> you sign up, you register. And when I grow older, I want to find a job. Being bilingual is a quality that is very researched. <laughs> yes, it is researched, but what she means to say is sought after. She was translating the French recherché. So can you see how children are using all their languages? Um, from a policy perspective, I would just like to very quickly look at some examples. UNESCO, first of all, in 1953, supporting education in the mother tongue, especially for um, children in, in, in multiple language contexts, in colonial contexts, because it is important for them psychologically, sociologically, and educationally. However, today, we still have situations where children are being punished for using the mother tongue. And this is an example from 2014 in Luxembourg. Children punished for speaking Portuguese in kindergarten and Maison Relais. That's really going to help them learn, isn't it? Reminds me of this um, poster in Corsica. This is all, this is rules, school rules, what you cannot do. Il est défendu de parler corse et de cracher à terre. That means students are forbidden to speak um, Corsican and spit on the floor. Corsican and speaking Corsican and spitting on the floor, 
the same level. <laughs> to reject a child's language in a school is to reject the child. When the message, implicit, implicit or explicit, um, it communicated to the children in the school is, leave your language and culture at the schoolhouse door, children leave a central part of who they are, their identities, at the schoolhouse door. So when they feel this rejection, they are much less likely to participate actively and confidently in the classroom context. Sometimes we actually want to exclude languages, and yet children need to use their languages. Don't be afraid of children's mother tongues. Um, children have rights. The UN Convention on the Rights of a Child, Article 30, says that in child-friendly language, you have the right to practice your own culture, language or religion, or anyone you want. And there are also a lot of interesting projects to actually develop and encourage multilingualism. We all know of the Erasmus um, project, one of the actually, well, actually one of the most um, successful EU projects ever. Nine million people benefited from that. And the one million Erasmus babies, I believe. <laughs> I'd just like to tell you about another one that you might not know of and which I think is brilliant. It is the Many Languages, One World Essay Contest. It's open to university students. The, the students are encouraged or asked to write an essay, about 2,000 words, in one of the six languages of the UN. So English, French, Arabic, Chinese, Russian, or Spanish. But that language must be the student's foreign language. My son participated and won the first um, ever Many Languages One World competition. And he was very, very pleased because he was invited to go to New York. And they actually um, spoke at the General Assembly. This is him over there. He wrote, so let's see this. He had English and French as a language of instruction, English as a home language, Portuguese as his mother tongue, Arabic from his dad's side. Which language did he write his essay in? Spanish. <laughs> because Spanish was his first foreign language. And this is why he won. I'm going to give you a little extract of his um, essay, the very first paragraph, which I thought was really good. He's obviously my son. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to read it to you in Spanish. Please forgive me for my Spanish accent. So what did he write? Tenía cuatro años la primera vez que cogí un avión. Estaba entusiasmado, estaba confundido. Le había hecho muchas preguntas a mi madre durante la hora y media de viaje de Porto hacia París. Con mucha paciencia um, respondió a todas mis preguntas. Cuando estábamos en el aeropuerto, so here's me speaking to my mom, to my son, throughout the whole of the um, trip, okay? There was someone behind listening to us. And this woman said, So, cuando estábamos en el aeropuerto, mi, ma mi madre oyó una pa pasajera que estaba sentada detrás de nosotros decir en portugués, ¡Qué increíble! Había un una madre que estaba hablando con su hijo. El niño le hacía preguntas en portugués. Y la madre respondía en inglés. Y estaban teniendo una conversación perfectamente normal. Esa es la historia multilingüe de mi vida. This is how he started his essay. And this is actually true. There was this woman, she couldn't believe it. How is it possible? The child is asking questions in Portuguese, the mother is answering in English, and they are having a perfectly normal conversation. That is how we function. We crazy multilinguals. Um, also, in terms of the European Charter for Regional and Minority Languages, that has also helped support and encourage the um, protection of regional languages, um, not only for the languages themselves, but for Europe's cultural wealth and traditions. However, we're still not quite there yet. This is a story from last week in the French papers. A little girl was born in Brittany, or a little boy was born in Brittany, and the parents wanted to give him a Britain name, this name. However, the parents could not write it with the N and the tilde because it doesn't exist in the French characters. So they were forbidden from calling him this name. I can't really say it. So it, we're still not quite accepting all of um, the multilingualism that exists in Europe. Very quickly, the one plus two policy in Europe, one mother tongue plus two foreign languages, has helped develop um, Europeans' bilingualism and multilingualism, and of 
course, very early language learning, which is very big. People, the children are starting to learn languages from the age of three. And the CLIL or not to CLIL debate. I'd like to, I don't know if you know of the ECML, the European Centre for Modern Languages. They have loads of very interesting um, materials and resources for teachers of um, foreign languages. Do look it up. But I think Europe's foreign multilingualism is a little bit um, artificial because it talks about one mother tongue plus two foreign languages, but what mother tongue? Which mother tongue? What about children's of other mother tongues? What about non-European languages that exist in Europe? What about other European languages that exist in your particular country? What about children's multilingual repertoires? What about literacy development? What about teachers' multilingual repertoires? Do we ever talk about teachers' multilingual repertoires? Do you actually bring your languages to the classroom? Are you proud of showing children that you are also multilingual and that they should be proud as well? I'm just going to skip quickly. Therefore, I think multilingualism has got nothing to do with language, actually. Multilingual education is about recognition and acknowledgement of um, individuals' literacies, um, identities, and backgrounds. It's making those identities and those languages visible in the classroom. It's about developing self-esteem and self-confidence, communication and connection between peoples across borders, intercultural understanding, tolerance and values, as well as language. And it's empowering. This little 13-year-old wrote, wrote, I love you, in her five languages. I love you, je t'aime. This is in Bangla, from Bangladesh. Ich liebe dich. And in... And what I should say, my languages are my confidences, my pride, my achievement. It is my difference from others. It is my power. And she is holding the world in her hand over here. Just a very quick, um, before we finish... Reference to Mandela, my hero, South Africa, right? The connection. He's got two interesting quotes that link up with the talk. Education is the most powerful weapon which can be used to change the world. How can multilingual education help change the world? If you talk to a man in his language, he understands. Um, he go, it goes to his head. But if you talk to him in his language, it goes to his heart. Let's talk to children's hearts. Children are geniuses. Let's use that linguistic genius. So all I recommend is that you keep calm and be multilingual. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> <It's over there. laughs>